Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Fijo Jr. and I'm a fourth generation Larrakia man um, from my father, my grandfather, and my great grandfather in what our culture calls grandfather law. Traditionally, when people from other lands visit Aboriginal country, a welcome to country will be performed by a traditional owner, not only to acknowledge the original inhab inhabitants past and present, but to give those receiving welcome to country safe passage through our lands under the guidance and protection of our ancestors. Uh, sorry, it is my honour to welcome you to Larrakia land today. While you're here, you will hear the voices of our ancestors. When you leave, you'll take the Larrakia message with you. Reverend W. Fijo, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now, before we begin, I'm just going to take care of a housekeeping issue. So we have two audiences in the room. One is online and one is in the room. When it gets to the Q&A session, I'm going to take questions from the online audience first until the end of the webinar. So it runs until 4 o'clock. And then in the second half of the presentation, I'll take questions from the audience and Robin will be here to answer in-house questions. Now, this series came into being as a result of discussions I had with colleagues about the significance of the year 2020, especially because to Indigenous people, this year marks the 250th anniversary year of the European invasion. I wondered how should us Indigenous people mark the anniversary. We continually, once a year, commiserate the anniversary date of the 26th of January as the day of the permanent European invasion of Indigenous country across Australia. While we wait for progress to be made on a number of significant issues that are important to Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Australia, such as treaty making, recognition of Indigenous people in the Australian constitution in a meaningful way, and a truth-telling process to initiate national conversations about Australia's colonisation history. We know now that a majority of Australians are in favour of a formal truth-telling process, so this truth-telling webinar series is one way to mark the invasion anniversary year. In the first webinar in the series, Professor Mick Dodson spoke about his role as Treaty Commissioner to the treaty-making process in the Northern Territory. That webinar and the three more presentations in the series will be available on YouTube afterwards. The webinar today is about truth-telling the massacre history of Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory of Australia. This is one aspect of a larger continent-wide Australian Research Council funded project that examined the nature, <clears throat> extent, location and details of the killing of Aboriginal people in Australia after permanent European colonisation. The topic of mass killing of Indigenous people in Australia is a topic that should be part of a broader truth-telling conversation <coughs> excuse me, about how colonisation affected the lives of Indigenous people in the past and how it still affects the lives of Indigenous people in the present. It should be part of a broader truth-telling conversation as the Massacre Research Project reveals the killing of Aboriginal people in the past remains a strong memory in the lives of Aboriginal people in the present. And because the mass killing of Aboriginal people is memorialised in some parts of Australia annually by both descendants of victims and descendants of perpetrators. And because the Massacre Research Project has shown that the killing of Aboriginal people in Australia occurred well into the 20th century. It was not something that happened so long ago that contemporary Australians can say it is old history. My colleague Nic Nicola Bullo and I would like to honour with recognition Professor Lyndall Ryan of the University of Newcastle for her pioneering work on massacre history in Australia. And we would also like to honour with recognition Professor Ryan's colleagues on the Massacre Map of Australia Research Project. Which is why it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr Robin Smith, 
who's one of the academics working closely with Professor Ryan. In today's presentation, Dr. Robin Smith will briefly take us through the background of the Massacre Map of Australia, before turning to the history of the massacres of Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. The word massacre conjures a perception that many people at one time are killed. But at this, as this presentation will show, the definition of what constitutes a massacre can literally mean less than a dozen people killed qualifies as a massacre. And for this reason, the method of calculating what constitutes the definition of a massacre will be discussed by Dr. Smith. So please now join me in giving a warm welcome to today's guest presenter, Dr. Robin Smith. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if I'm not looking directly at you, I'm sorry. There's a screen here to my left to which I need to refer from time to time. Uh, we should warn people that this presentation does include some distressing material for, um, and it includes graphic descriptions of some massacre events. So please brace for that. This slide here deals with the actual Massacre Map website, which I must stress does not include any images, distressing or otherwise. So uh, just please don't confuse the two. On the slide there, you'll see the URL for the map itself. And um, beneath that is the various people who have contributed to the research team over time. There have been um, individual state researchers together with national researchers, together with some very clever people who deal with digital cartography, who make the little yellow dots appear on the digital map. I have no idea why, how, it's what I would normally refer to as white man's magic. Oh. This, um, this image here is, was Australia in about 1780. You'll see across the top, there's the index line from the Frontier Massacre site. There's a lot of information contained on that site. The map, obviously, is under the tab map. Across the top of the map page is a time slider, which goes from 1780 to 1930. And you can play with that slider, um, adjust it both ways, start and finish, to see um, what period of time you're interested in and what was happening at that time in Australia. That's what Australia looked like by 1930. And that, I must say, is indicative. It's, it's not um, by any means final. There are many sites that are not yet on there and there are many sites, I suspect, that we'll never know about that won't appear on there. But as you can see, it's not a pretty picture. What um, the research team has discovered is that there are particular characteristics of massacre. I apologise to those who can't read this on the screen here. Um, I'll just take you through it. These are not random events. They're not opportunistic barbarism. They are usually reprisal. In fact, they're always reprisal. Um, initially, in the Northern Territory, the reprisal was for um, a dispute over water or women. Later, when pastoralists had moved in, these became reprisals for the um, spearing of cattle. Um, 
so yes, the abduction and sexual violence against Aboriginal women. Uh, water, the threatening of water resources when Aboriginal people would attack. And if you think about that, think about um, a waterhole somewhere in outback NT towards the end of the dry season. There is not a lot of water left and some man lobs on horseback with um, a stock, a herd of cattle some goats, some sheep, and they're fairly thirsty. So you can imagine what Aboriginal people are thinking as they're watching their waterhole be absolutely engulfed by animals they've never seen before who were not just drinking from that water. They were fouling it, which wrecked it as a drinking source as well. So the earlier um, clashes circled around those sorts of things. Uh, they're not spontaneous events, they are planned. They are secret, and it's not intended that any witnesses survive to tell the tale. The assassins and the victims are known to each other. Again, this is, um, they're not random. The purpose is to errat eradicate the victims and force them or force them into submission. Eradication was always preferable because then you could destroy the evidence. Generally, they're confined to a geographical, one geographical space. However, in the Northern Territory, there were what I call rolling massacres that, that went over large geographical areas and could, can be, discreetly um, placed into a series of single massacres, but that were all tied to one catalyst that triggered all of those events. The, the rolling ones to which I just referred are actually officially classified as um, genocidal massacres. And that, that's, that's the name given to events such as Coniston, because that rolled over many weeks and a very great geographical area. Um, but there are others. There is a code of silence afterwards which indicates that people knew that they were either acting illegally or immorally uh, or against the laws of nature or whatever. However, people will often talk about them long after the event. And by that, I mean perpetrators and survivors. In fact, there are cases where perpetrators actually wrote in newspapers, books, uh, various publications about what they had done, but sometimes 20, 30, 40 years later. And the most reliable evidence, of course, is provided by the uh, witnesses, perpetrators and survivors, again, long after the event. Michael, I keep turning this off. All right, so in the Northern Territory, potted history of um, white visitation, because we know the Macassans had been coming and various other exchanges had been going on. But basically, by 1869, George Goiter had climbed up over the cliffs at Bullicky Point and blam, white settlement. And so the Northern Territory of South Australia was established. Now, with that, came the Overland Telegraph Line. And if you move that time slider to when the OT line was under construction, you will see that the first massacres, the dots that appear on that map for the Northern Territory, are along the Stewart Highway, it, heading from the centre north. That was the Overland Telegraph construction. The ones up in the top end to the east and west came later. 
Now, 1873, um, there are some very nice fellows who'd been uh, working on the Overland Telegraph line. The guy on the end, on the left, is J.A.G. Little, who was, I think, um, a supervisor, superintendent, something like that, on the line. Remember his name. This is the uh, Barrow Creek Telegraph Station, where um, a massacre took place in 1874. Killed in that massacre, sorry, killed in the initial Aboriginal attack on the station was Little's brother. Now, the Aboriginal attack on the station was, of course, re reported as some sort of bar barbaric and um, random event. It wasn't. There are various stories. One is that uh, the telegraph station had been built on a sacred site. Um, another is that um, women had been abused, stolen and abused. However, retribution was, was planned and carried out. Now, in, in those parties, there were two parties. One was led by Mounted Constable Montague, I think, and the other one was led by J.A.G. Little with no police in it, meaning that, that the second party that Little led was not subject to police orders. Um, in this massacre, 11 were recognised as having been killed officially, um, some put the total at 50, uh, some put it at higher than 100. Now you've got, you've got two parties on horseback with weapons, r rifles, going after people on foot with spears over a couple of weeks. So. You know, we, on this map, we go in at the low end of how many we think were killed. Um, and for this very reason, there are some wild variations with how many people were killed, but we can say quite confidently that at least this number were killed. Uh, one of the police involved in the Barrow Creek uh, retribution was Mounted Constable Gayson. And he is commemorated in a street name in the Northern Territory. Little, as I said, was an active participant. Um, and he is commemorated in Northern Territory place names. Ah, now, this one is actually an example of uh, a rolling or genocidal massacre. Um, Mole Hill, Crescent Lagoon, Harris Lagoon, Calder Range, August and September 1875. So that was a series of massacres, but all connected to the one event, one trigger. There were two reprisal parties of 10 men, one uh, led by Little, the other by Gayson, uh, and the death toll was uh, likely in excess of 150 or 200. And as I said, Little is commemorated in NT place names. Pastoralism, as I mentioned before, to the east and the west, that's when uh, you see those dots appearing. Arnhem Land, uh, Arnhem Land pastoralism, not so successful because the um, Aboriginal people of Arnhem Land were very successful in pushing back. By the time pastoralism spread to the VRD region in the West, um, 
the technology, I suppose, of massacres had changed from initially where you had uh, soldiers who were on foot carrying muskets in places like Tasmania um, and a musket being a, a scatter approach, so far more likely to wound than kill and soldiers on foot obviously being a lot slower than someone on horseback with an automatic weapon. Um, and that was definitely the case by the time that pastoralism happened in the Victoria River region. And I should say that I have discovered with my colleague um, Chris Owen in WA that um, that little old line there that says there's the division between the Northern Territory and Western Australia didn't mean a thing. There were massacres that went over the border from the VRD into the Kimberley. In fact, we have one that's directly related to the spearing death of um, Johnny Durack. And it went from um, the VRD into the Kimberley. And we think the combined death toll for that was at least 160. That is a very big massacre. Uh, this, which you won't be able to read, is an administrator's report to um, the South Australian um, governor. Dated the 31st of December, 1884. And the heading of this is Aboriginals and Settlement. But the bit that is circled there uh, says, Mr. Lindsay Crawford states that on the Victoria River, the blacks are daring and defiant. On the Lemon River, they're spearing his cattle and that he must take measures to prevent recurrences. That can only mean one thing. And bear in mind that in many of these places, there was no police presence. There were very few police. They were thin on the ground. And so the pastoralists did take matters into their own hands. That's one of the problems that we as researchers have with this map, because there's no past, well, very few pastoralists later brag about how many Aboriginal people they killed. Ah, oh, yes, mounted. Constable William Henry Wilshire. This guy, um, I think the kindest thing I can say about him is that he was psychologically challenged. Um, he had been in the centre and he wreaked havoc down there. Then after a trial in which he was found not guilty of murdering Aboriginal people, he was posted, I think, in Port Augusta. It might even have been back in Adelaide. But when they were having all this trouble in the Victoria River region, what did they do? They sent old William here to um, go and sort it out. And that is just such, a, that is exactly the type of portrait that I would expect Wilshire to have shot of himself. He, among many other massacres, um, was Black Gin Creek in 1894. And I'm quoting from Wilshire's book. In the month of June 1894, we came across some tracks of natives that had been recently killing cattle on Victoria Run. They scattered in all directions, setting fire to the grass on each side of us, throwing occasional spears and yelling at us. It's no use mincing matters. The Martini Henry Carbines at this critical moment were talking English in the silent majesty of those great eternal rocks. The mountain was swathed in a regal robe of fiery grandeur and its ominous roar was close upon us. The weird, awful beauty of the scene held us spellbound 
for a few seconds. So he's bragging right there about a massacre. Um, and that extract indicates that not only was he there, but he was its mastermind. Now, you'll note that um, Wilshire was very careful to talk up his own prowess with the rifle, but he was also very careful to, not to say how many people he killed. So for that reason, Black Gin Creek mass Massacre cannot yet be entered on the map because I can't say were there six, were there 50, were there whatever. But, um, and it is the case that Wilshire had the support of most pastoralists in that region. Uh, Lindsay Crawford, who was the first manager of VRD station in 1895, said, during the last 10 years, in fact, since first white man settled here, we've held no communication with the natives at all, except with the rifle. They've never been allowed near this station or the art stations being too treacherous and warlike. William Wilshire is commemorated in Northern Territory place names. And interestingly, actually, the Alice Springs Council, uh, Alice Springs Town Council at this very moment is engaging in community consultation about whether that street name in Alice Springs should be changed. Now, it's not up to the council. They have no power to um, make that decision, but they can lobby the place names committee to have it changed. And it is quite contentious in um, Alice Springs, I can tell you. Um, another example of a massacre that can't be entered arises from an interaction between, oh yes, between, again, uh, Mounted Constable William Wilshire and the manager of Andulia Station, Alec Ross. This was in 1887. On the 15th of September, 1886, Mr. Ross reported cattle killing on the Ross Creek, asking people to attend, asking police, sorry, to attend. Wilshire recorded that in the police journal and said he couldn't attend at once because um, his colleague Erwin Wormbrand was absent on duty with two native constables but was expected back soon. Wilshire left for Andulia on the 29th of September, returning on the 24th of October, having made inquiries and a search. Nothing more appeared in the journal about the matter until the 16th of January the following year when the journal recorded that um, MC Wilshire and NC, that's Native Constable Collins and Archie, left for Andulia Station to get a bullock, it being a present from Mr Ross, 14 miles. Now, I can tell you that the death of a bullock up here started a war. So they were very prized possessions and they weren't just given away and certainly not for no reason. That was a reward. But because I have no idea how many people were killed during the inquiries and search undertaken by Mounted Constable Wilshire, that can't be entered on the map yet. However, Mr Ross wrote about massacres in the South Australian Register in 1928. Uh, most of the times things were very rough and the blacks gave us a lot of trouble among the stock. The same trouble experienced at Owen Springs and all the places mentioned on the Fink. We petitioned the South Australian Government to allow the police officer at Alice Springs to organise a body of black trackers to assist the trooper in stopping the cattle killers. This was granted, and six of the best boys from the southern station were placed under MC Wormbrand, who had them well drilled in short time. It had a wholesome effect, and cattle killing came to an end. Wholesome effect is another phrase that you'll come across a lot in relation to massacres being um, working very well as deterrence. Again, no one mentions numbers, just a wholesome effect. Now there is, um, of course, Wilshire's the star of the show. That's the nature of the bloke. That is 
Erwin Wormbrand, bottom left with the beard. He was every bit as lethal as Wilshire, but he didn't brag about it. He was far more circumspect. And oddly enough, he doesn't have a street named after him anywhere in the NT. Perhaps because his um, surname is not anglicised enough or something, I don't know. That's Wormbrand as well, with prisoners in neck chains. The date of that photograph is unknown, but Wormbrand served from 1881 to 1888 in the NT, and it was in Central Australia. Now, that, so far I've dealt with the, um, uh, the, the European or white historical records. I want to talk here about Aboriginal historical records and how Aboriginal records record these things. That is a um, 19, what, 10, 12. That's a photo taken by um, Ryko on Bathurst Island. Now, have a look at those guys. They're in a military rifle formation with the front row kneeling and using their spears as to aim and fire at the, with the back row upright. Those men are far too young to have experienced the um, conflict that went on with the establishment of Fort Dundas in 1824. So this has been incorporated through oral history into corroboree to be remembered because there is no way known that those men would otherwise have had that experience with rifles. Now this one, it is at Rabuna Island. Again, it's a RICO, 1916. It doesn't identify, but it is possibly a reenactment of a trial bay incident that was associated with a massacre at a place called Gangan. In that, two European blokes were killed by Aboriginal people, and you can see that they're sneaking up behind them to whack them on the head. Um, that was in reprisal for, I can't remember now was if that was women, would have been women not cattle stealing over there. So, yeah. Um, Daryl Lewis wrote that um, Bradshaw Station, that's VRD, um, survives as oral history. Peter Murray, who owned Cooler Bar and blah, blah, blah. Following story by an Aboriginal man named Johnson. Bradshaw had continual trouble with bush blacks breaking into the station store and stealing bags of flour, tobacco and so on. Eventually the station whites decided to leave a bag of flour laced with poison in the store. The bag was stolen and a big mob of Aborigines were pointed, poisoned. Nicola was pointing. Uh, a similar incident at Florida Station, once again with poisoning. Richard Trudgeon wrote about this. This was done with poisoned horse meat. And Trudgeon writes, uh, to this day, um, Yolnu people won't touch horse meat because that fear of being poisoned lives with them. Um, now, that was 1885 that that happened. The Gangan Massacre, 1911. Remember the photo of uh, Rabuna Island? A police, female's, a police tracker's female relative from the Roper happened upon a men's ceremony and was killed. A uh, this was a reprisal by police after the tracker told the police where the Yonu people were. Two survived. Galaroy Yunipingu said, at Gan Gan, these men on horseback performed their duties and killed an entire clan group, men, women and children. They shot them out and killed them any way they could so they could take the land. Then they rode to Barani Barani 
and killed many of our um, Yawidi Gumaj, the saltwater people, who cared f uh, for the great ceremonies at Barani Barani. There are few places in our lives as sacred as Gangan. Gan. From its fresh waters, all things come, and Barani Barani. Bronwyn Unipingu wrote about Gangan. Gan. And she said that while the men were away at the ceremony, women and children were in the camp. None of them knew that a party of men with guns were riding towards the camp on horses. They were led by a man called Bellani, also known as Bill Harney, not the waterman Bill Harney. A yellow fella from the Roper River area. The armed men rode into the camp and shot the older women. The men heard the shooting ran from their spot to see what was happening, saw their wives being shot dead, so they attacked the killers with spears. The rifles were too much for the spears and the tribes were driven back to a large lagoon nearby. The men who went into the water were shot and killed. Other women shot and killed at their camp. Young women, children and men were captured by Bilhani's men. Bodies were lying everywhere. Those hiding in the bushes watched Hani and his men start their journey back, taking with them the captives. But this is not the end of the story. He returned next year and collected skulls of the people he'd murdered. And later he sold them to a museum and made a lot of money. He came back, he went to Trial Bay, which is where that photo was taken and he went to Burani Burani. There they shot more people and he went back and he collected the skulls. Bosun's Waterhole Massacre, same thing. Juki Pump Jack told a story and I'm running out of time so I will not read this one out, but um, his account was corroborated by Tim Rouse among others and that Bosun's Waterhole Massacre, the, the trigger for that was uh, the spearing of a milking cow. Bogan, Corella and Fish Creek, 1892 to 1896. That was one series of massacres that had um, a single catalyst. And that was the terrible murder of two white men at Creswell Downs. Uh, Charles Deloitte and George Clark were their names. Central to this series of massacres was a guy named Tom Perry, who was recalled in the oral history accounts as Jack Berry. But it's the same guy. And this was a massacre that rolled over um, four years until finally um, Tom Perry was killed and that was considered an end to it. Uh, and in that, in that instance, um, a whole bunch of people fled to uh, Eva Downs, which was run by a guy named Harry Bate, and he told uh, everyone in pursuit of them to get off his station and not to shoot people there. So he actually saved a lot of Aboriginal people. Uh, Abner, oh, Abner Range, 1892. Again, that's a lot of text. I won't read that, but I'll, I'll leave that for you to read. This, these slides will be attached to the, um, the YouTube presentation of this lecture. Um, yeah, one of those in this Abner Range series uh, was uh, took place at a place named Malakoff Creek, uh, which was named by a pastoralist named Tom Linnett after a bloody battle in the um, Crimean War. So um, another thing that I could say quite safely is when you're looking at maps, place names, those sorts of things, consider the types of names that are used and see whether you can figure out how something got that name. Uh, artwork, of course, is um, a principal way that Aboriginal people record their oral history. This one's called Remembering the Directions in Which People uh, Fled. 
by a Yuen Demu um, artist. And this is a spectacular series um, of photographs by Therese Ritchie called Lead in My Grandmother's Body. Now, that's my dreadful photography with all sorts of reflections coming off the paintings, but each of those individuals, including the children, have a bullet um, in the photos. The men have the bullet between the teeth, the children, it's in their hands, but um, it, it really, really striking work. And they are people from uh, the Gulf Country, Borolula, um, Yanua, people, I think, from memory. So they are dealing with the, um, the massacres that took place there. Before I move on to nomenclature, I just want to mention um, libraries. There are a whole bunch of libraries in outback Northern Territory. And by that, I do not mean buildings. I mean people, Aboriginal people who carry this knowledge in their heads. Uh, through oral histories, um, teaching, ceremonies, those sorts of things. Um, I need to become a member of some of those libraries so that I can get to those people and speak to them if they are willing to do so because they will be the key to untapping all the, um, all the massacres that we don't yet have recorded. So this is what I was mentioning before about the names of things. Massacre Hill, Skull Creek, Attack Creek, Blackfellow Bones Bore, Black Gin Creek, Waterloo, Mistake Creek, Nigger's Leap, Nigger Creek, Blackfellow Island, Black Hill, Black Bore, Policeman's Crossing, Poison Creek, Poison Creek Bore, Malakoff Creek. All of those are clues in researching massacres. Mistake Creek, 1890. Couple of police taking 60 Aboriginal men suspected of cattle killing, one beast killed. Neck chains, they were taking them to uh, Wyndham from the Vic River. They were camped on a creek one night. While they were there, they got word that the culprit, one person, had been arrested to release the prisoners. No, too hard. While they were chained together at the neck, shot dead, thrown on a fire, burnt. The name of the creek they were on? Mistake. Frontier Massacre Project is incomplete and probably always will be. We, we don't know whether we'll finish it. We, how could you know that? Um, Figures recorded in the, the map database are conservative for the, those killed. So just bear that in mind when you're looking at the map. Australia has yet to acknowledge frontier massacres. And the NT um, has the highest average number of victims per massacre at 40.19. Uh, which is marginally higher than um, New South Wales at 39.37. But bear in mind that it was, massacre was probably a lot easier up here because of the space and because of the lack of police presence and soldier, you know, garrison groups and, and those sorts of things. So people could do their own thing um, unseen, if you like, which, may or may not explain why we seem to have the highest average. I don't know. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly, for having me. Thank you, Robin. Can everybody join me to give Robin um, a very warm thank you for that presentation. And uh, 
Robin, we do have a lot of uh, questions that have come in from our online audience and we'll get to those in a moment. I would just like to begin and open the Q&A session with some comments um, and to say thank you. The um, presentation was very interesting, um, very uh, sombre content um, and uh, there's a lot uh, that I would like to um, talk with you uh, some more about the presentation. Perhaps we can do that in the next hour. Um, we are running out of time and I will get some questions from people online in a moment. But it seems to me from listening to your presentation that um, in terms of the truth-telling theme, um, there are a number of uh, issues that come out of your, uh, your presentation there. Um, you know, this history of around a code of silence in Australia and the um, way that manifested in terms of how communication uh, about and how messaging um, about the killings um, occurred between perpetrators um, and, the, and the sort of um, broader frontier community um, through the way, uh, you know, um, killings and intent to kill were written about in the archive records um, is very interesting, as is the fact that... Uh, as you were referring to the names of places where uh, that are known massacre sites, it seems to me that there is a whole um, landscape of memory there um, about history of um, truth-telling massacre history that is not, you know, it needs to be addressed in terms of the conversation about history through, um, you know, it can come about through the treaty-making process um, and, you know, uh, we have to think about uh, ways of uh, initiating the conversation in our local communities with people. Uh, I would like to now switch to having a look at the uh, online questions. And you need that. Just while you're doing that, um, one I should have mentioned um, the language that you mentioned, Kelly, with police with and bet between police, pastoralists, all those sorts of things. Um, euphemisms were very popular. So um, parties that went out to disperse the natives were not dispersal parties at all. They were massacre parties. Um, police Inspector Falsch invited one of his officers who was down in the bush somewhere leading a reprisal uh, massacre, he, he actually wrote, I cannot give you specific instructions. However, I invite you to have a picnic with the natives. What, what else could that mean except shoot at will? So yes, the use of language, the, it, that was almost code between them and, and they each, they all knew what that meant. So, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question here from Reese B. How big were the posses? Mm. Varied. Um, usually they were comprised of one or two police officers leading different parties and the rest were volunteers. So they could, of course, in the pastoral districts, they would have been pastoralists. Um, closer to town settlements, they could have been, you know, the mayor, the publican, who was often the mayor anyway, the schoolmaster. It, it just depended who was around. At a guess, I'd say six to eight in a, um, a reprisal pack. They were armed by the government, though. The ammunition was supplied by the government. And one very frustrating thing that I found is that if anyone was accounting for how much ammunition out and how much ammunition came back, it never made it into a record anywhere. So that's another thing we don't know. These are, just, these are gaps in the story. <clears throat> All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the um, online uh, audience has, has moved on. But what can you uh, tell us about the difference in the role between police trackers and um, native troopers? 
in terms of facilitating, you know, incursions on in, onto country um, through bush and uh, facilitating the the killing mm. of the whites. Mm. Um, there were those up here who were advocating for the what they called the Queensland Police model, which was the use of what they called native police. Pastoralists wanted it. Some of the police wanted it. The South Australian administration did not. So while there were um, native constables, they were called here, they tended not to be armed because the Queensland native police were lethal. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is that people picked them up and put them on the wrong country and of course they were terrified. And they had weapons, so they used them. Now that just turned into wholesale bloodshed. So that model was never adopted up here, but they did have native police and they were, on the whole, imported from Queensland. You know, obviously they were very good trackers. Um, but it was not as devastating in the NT as it was in Queensland or had been in Queensland. <clears throat> okay, well, um on that note, I think uh, we've reached time and uh, most of our online audience have um, moved on. So I might um, say once again, thank you very much, Robin, for the presentation today. It was very interesting. Thank you. And um, could you join me, please, in giving Robin a, a warm goodbye clap? Thank you. <laughs> thank you.